how you doing? Daniel Ruiz Tyson is available for Monday, the 31st of August 2020, with me, Daniel Ruiz Tyson, episode 264. Hope you're all well, keeping on doing what you need to be doing to keep yourself going. It is the end of summer, though the last couple of weeks it has felt like we've jumped straight into autumn. I've got seven tops on for this record this morning. It's uh, 10, 16 hours here in uh, South London, all across London, all across the UK. It's the same time. Seven tops on. I don't mind. It is cold but it's preferable to that heat wave that we had here earlier in the month. The weather here is as erratic as I am. It's going from one extreme to the other. It's bank holiday too. That crept up on me. I think I was listening to my uncle, who much like he claims every year that the Champions League final is on ITV, despite all the evidence that you show him to uh, prove that he's wrong. He was claiming that this year Bank Holiday had been moved uh, to the penultimate week in August. I don't think he'll be big enough to uh, call me up today to say, you know, you were right. Normally, Bank Holidays unsettle me. I do need my routine. I keep saying every time there's a Bank Holiday that it would be nice to have a couple of these Bank Holidays spread out into the winter. I really do think, although our weather is changing and our summers have got hotter in recent years i think that uh, for people who struggle with winter it would help them to have a couple of bank holidays to break up the long winters one just before the christmas countdown at least before that christmas countdown kicks in i think that would be brilliant and i think that even people who prefer their bank holidays in the summer would look at that and think You know, that wasn't too bad, actually. I really like that. Anyway, this end of August bank holiday, it doesn't really bother me, partly because the weather means we're not going to have too many idiots gathering uh, together, putting the social distance into one side as the drink takes hold. And also, just right now, it's such a weird time the last six months that almost every day feels like a bank holiday for all the wrong reasons. And my plan today is just put the show out, go for a run at lunchtime. By the time I come back, the show should be out everywhere. And I'll put the links out and that's it. I'm just going to try and take it easy. I do feel very lethargic. It's a combination of being tired and lethargic. I don't know which one is winning that battle. On the run in front, Strava issues continuing, which is really annoying because I do like my stats. I do like to chart my progress with anything. And uh, Friday, I did a decent run, 45 minutes, I think I was running. And it only, I think it only logged the first uh, nine minutes, then it ran into syncing issues again, even though I've already downloaded the, uh, the, the app that they told me I needed to download since they've done something different to Strava. It was the first time on Friday that the syncing issues hadn't involved the armband. I had thought that maybe it was down to the phone being squashed into the armband holder. I've reverted to having the phone back down my uh, interior reversed shorts. I'm not gonna try and explain that again because I think I'll actually confuse myself, but it's the first time that the syncing issues happened when I'd reverted back to the uh, pre-armband era of running. At the end of the day, I told myself at least I've done the run. You know, I know that I've done the run. I just, I like to see those stats. I like to chart the progress or the non-progress as the case may be. On the positive front with regard to the running, I'm pleased that in the last couple of months, the knee specific exercises that I picked up from YouTube that I've been doing pretty much uh, six days a week, I'm pleased that they seem to have worked, that they seemed to have strengthened the knees, particularly the left knee, which was the problematic knee. There were a couple of weeks where I was running with an old school bandage around the knee, which uh, made me feel like I was about 60 years old. But all of these things that I've done have helped. And the knee is certainly stronger than it was at the start of the summer. And it just goes to show that if you do put in the effort with YouTube, which I've never really been inclined to do just because you can lose your life on there. There's so much stuff on there. But since, uh, you know, taking over the running of this flat, the amount of small DIY jobs that I've learned to do uh, via YouTube, the knee 
strengthening stuff and you know various running techniques or if I think there's something I could improve with my running or breathing whatever it's not a bad place to go to as long as I just uh, don't spend too much time on there I'm, I'm fine with that I don't know about you but every day right now and for the last six months really every single day just feels unique to me and not in a good way we're not going to get this time back at the end of our lives. And this just feels like a real nothing period. The kind of period where at the end of your life or maybe, you know, the epitaph and your stone when all this ends, there maybe should be an asterisk on that stone to denote that your life took in this pandemic. You have good periods in your life, you have bad periods. The latter motivate you to fight back, to work your way back to the good if you use it in a positive way and maybe to learn from that bad period to ensure that any further bad periods, because life is always going to test you, but the lessons that you learned during that previous tough period may help you deal with the next period that comes along in a better fashion. And that battle, those battles, they give you a momentum. But this, this nothingness that's being shared by everybody, it's just, uh, it's so weird. It's so hard to work out what to do. You can have everything planned in your head. You can have a way forward mapped out. But until we have a vaccine, a vaccine that works. And I was reading yesterday, I think on The Guardian, that they're, um, or The Observer of Peace and The Observer, that. An initial vaccine needs to be 30 to 50 percent positive in terms of results to be regarded as a success, which uh, struck me as a, a little low. You know, I'd like uh, I'd like those stats to be a bit higher before I'm being injected with something. But uh, you know, the situation is a is a bad one, so I guess we'll have to take that. And again, I I speak without no knowledge whatsoever of how vaccines are meant to work, but as I say, you can have everything mapped out. You can say, OK, I've got this plan. I've reassessed things. This unusual time has given me a bit more time to, to think about things, to think about where I'm going, to think about how I can improve things, where I can improve. But how to act on these things when the world has just come to a standstill? You can't do it right now. So it's just so unusual in every respect. I mentioned a few shows back that uh, one of the shocks I had was when I went to Wandsworth Town two or three weeks ago. It's sad to see the small businesses that have closed, but what really shocked me about Wandsworth Town, because they've got a big shopping centre there, and I'm not a big shopping centre guy, but it's one of the better ones. That one and the one in Putney, the Putney Exchange, are actually fairly decent. And I've gone there, and I was really shocked to see the amount of big businesses that were just boarded up that had closed and you start thinking about the amount of people who work there who have lost their jobs and how that would have impacted on them and their families their loved ones and that was something that I wasn't expecting and it's also reading about redundancies at places like Boots and pret a staples of the high street uh, certainly in pret a case a, a new addition to that world in the last 20-25 years and uh, these redundancies that are happening at uh, shops like these, they really bring home the fact that our high streets are dying right now because people aren't embracing a return to the offices. And who can blame them? I mean, I wouldn't want to return to the office regardless of a pandemic. And I certainly think hot desking has to be dead. It's interesting you can read about uh, some businesses that have gone back and how they're changing things around in the office, you know, spacing out the desks, etc. But quite a few of them are still running the whole hot desking thing, which I just don't think is hygienic at all. And in terms of the reluctance to return to the office, you know, who can blame these people? But you have to have a look at the impact already on the high street. People aren't going back to the office. People aren't buying their lunchtime sandwich. And you can see what it's quickly uh, doing to our high streets. Uh, an update on the cold water situation in the kitchen. It's a miserable drip. It's the uh, tap water equivalent of downloads for this show. Mickey Blue, as uh, touched on on Thursday's show, which was recorded, I think, as I was waiting for him to turn up. 
um, still hasn't called. This is Monday now, still hasn't called. And I rejigged my whole day for him last Thursday, not the first time I've done it. And last Thursday turned into an epic 19 hour day for me. It was close to midnight catching up on stuff and trying to get this uh, show out. I hadn't actually done the editing on episode 263 until I got back in the evening. And, you know, my concern about my eyes grows. I think part of that is these glasses, they're NHS specs. And I had been warned that the uh, thickness of the lenses, you know, could lead to the eyes feeling a bit more tired than they would otherwise. And, you know, the glasses are pressing down on the nose. But I think in general, when I take the glasses off, I'm just alarmed now at how bad the eyesight is. I need to address this. I had made contact with my usual uh, opticians a couple of weeks back. I haven't followed that up. They told me that they've got their usual branches closed, that I would have to go somewhere else, you know, an area that I don't know very well. But, you know, that, that can easily be sorted out. But I'm just thinking, OK, why have they closed this particular branch? Why is everybody working in this branch now? And uh, do I really want to do this right now? Do I really want to be coming home and having to bleach my entire face, my chin, not bleach, antibacterial wipe, you know, from putting my chin in a chin rest and the eyes are going to, you know, the optician's going to be right in front of my face. How is this going to work? Is this the right time to get an eye test? But the optician is going to be tweaking things. And if so, is that newly tweaked eye test going to be as thorough as a normal eye test would be because it would concern me just because the eyes are so bad right now. So this is something that I need uh, to tackle. Of course, there is a way around the um, the situation with the, uh, the the tap water. I'm back on the tap water now, away from the eyes onto the tap water. I've got a bottle of water, half a bottle of water to my side as I'm recording this. I didn't have that on Thursday. And of course, you know, I've gone out and bought a couple of big bottles of water from my shop last week, but those need to be carried home. That's extra weight. I'm already coming back with 10 pints of semi-skimmed milk. So it's not a, a good situation. Some days I'm getting water. Some days I'm not getting water. Again, this morning I'm struggling to get water. I'm trying to trick that cold water into giving me water. I'm trying all sorts of things. I've turned on the hot water for a while and bring in the cold water you know, fade it in, a bit like the intro to this show, fade it in, fade it back out, turn the tap again, trying to trick it into just blasting me some cold water or giving me any cold water, any amount. Then I turn the hot water off and see what kind of stream I have. Uh, more often than not, it's not good. It, it does work sometimes. So um, I'm concerned as to whether this is simply the tap is old or whether it might be an even more serious issue. And the first uh, port of call is try and see if I can get Mickey Blue out, save money. But it could be then that otherwise I have to go down the plumber route, which is, of course, going to hit me hard in the pocket. There's no doubt about it. I probably have fast tracked the issue. You know, the drip was driving me mad and I would tighten the tap. The tap wasn't great anyway. I would tighten the tap just to stop the drip in. And uh, obviously this is where I am now with uh, a tap that isn't giving me water when I need it. The long day incorporating the shopping into it on Thursday to save on travel costs, that involves some precarious bus trips for the first time. I mean, I've taken bus trips before that, but this is the first time I've been traveling at the wrong times. And I shouldn't have been surprised by how precarious these trips became, given that I'm aware that there is a 30 passenger limit on buses now in London. And by the time I went to visit my aunt and uncle in the late afternoon, the buses were starting to get dangerously full and the driver was having to stop the bus. There was a message over the speakers. The bus has reached its safe limit for everyone's safety. The driver has been instructed not to continue. And that's the first time I heard that message. And I'd heard it a few more times by the time I got home in the evening. And that's something that I need to bear in mind. I need to be very careful about what times I'm traveling on these buses, unless I'm commuting to the man at some point. There is no need for me to be on buses during rush hour. By the time I got to my aunt's, I wasn't able to stay long because you know the penny had dropped. I'm gonna have trouble getting home from here. So I just had a coffee. The highlight of my visit was another row breaking out between my aunt and uncle, uh, this time following his claim that he had already started dating my aunt back in the late 50s. 
when his job involved transporting water via a donkey to a local village in uh, deepest Andalusia in southern Spain. My aunt looked at him. She was looking at him as if to say, what are you talking about? She was simply not having it. What kind of girl do you think I was? You think just because I was one of the last two left at home and with a disabled mum that I was going to date a boy whose job involved working with a donkey? And uh, my uncle made the mistake of rolling his eyes at me. He hadn't responded to that remark, but he rolled his eyes. And unfortunately for him, my aunt caught the eye roll and she turned to me. She rarely looks at him when she's talking about him. <laughs> Sometimes that's, that's how deep her contempt for him can be. This man is deluded, she said to me. Thinks he had a chance of pulling me while he was working that donkey job. And she showed me some old pictures of them, some of the pictures I have seen. And, uh, you know, my uncle was a very good looking guy in his younger days. He had this kind of weird semi-afro hair and a very dark, good looking, good teeth. I always thought as a kid that he looked unusual just because his hair was very different to anyone else in the family. And, uh, you know, my cousins, they kind of had similar hair to their dad, but it wasn't as it, w it was more curly than, than, you know, uh, you know, the white man Afro look that my uncle had. But uh, so I would always look at him and think he looks very different to the rest of us. And in the same way that I would look at my dad and think that he looked very different. My dad was very dark, you know, and so when he produced a very pale looking uh, son, that was probably always going to be a problem for my dad. Though, to be fair, towards the end, my, even my dad was acknowledging the dangers of uh, sunbathing. He would always say, this son isn't the same one that I grew up with. It was the same son. It was just the world had finally uh, cottoned on to the fact that uh, sunbathing was dangerous. I left my aunt and uncles and my hunch that I would do well not to travel home any later was borne out. There was more grief on the bus. Passengers that were not being allowed onto the bus were kicking off. Passengers that were already on the bus but hadn't gone upstairs were kicking off too. There were seats available upstairs, but a lot of them weren't passengers that are used to going upstairs. Some came up. There was the unusual upper deck visual of a shopping trolley uh, being hoisted up the stairs by one passenger who had chosen to sit upstairs with their trolley. I mean, they had no option because the bus wasn't going to be moving unless a bunch of these uh, passengers uh, moved upstairs. And I suspect that we're going to be seeing more of this, more passengers who tend to be more your lower deck passengers now joining uh, the rest of us on the upper deck. Normally, I've never been one of those selfish passengers who takes up two seats. I'm not a passenger who has to be told to take his bag off the seat. That's a very London thing, I think. It's just very rude. But I am in a pandemic. I am that guy in a pandemic. And I leave my bag on the seat next to me. And if someone tries to sit next to me, and there's every chance that might happen if I ever risk traveling at such a, a late time again. If someone does try to sit next to me, I'll just get off. You know, they can have the seat. And, uh, you know, I won't kick off about it. They can have the seat. I'll just be sensible for the both of us and I'll be the one to get off and wait for the next bus or just uh, walk home. I think we're going to see more of these fraught bus journeys in London as the colder, wetter weather arrives. And, uh, you know, that's understandable, but we just need to remember how everything has changed now. We're not going to see more buses on the streets because TfL are flat ass broke. And you can have a look at the alternatives. Are you going to get on the underground? I'm certainly not. I mean, I don't really travel by underground anyway. It's a part of my life that uh, belongs really to, I think, around the time I launched this show in late 2012, I had three or four months of uh, traveling into the man via the tube before moving to another flat where I could get a bus there. And that's really the last time I had a regular involvement with the uh, Tube. And I used to know the underground network off by heart. I always used it, you know, as a kid, as a young guy, as a early middle-aged guy. But these days, I just, I wouldn't have a clue. Beyond the Northern Line, I think, in the Victoria Line, I, I think the rest of my underground uh, knowledge has just gone now. So if I'm not going to take the underground, what are the alternatives? Well, say you're going... Um, shopping, I don't know, and uh, 
You can't get on a bus because they're packed. I could run to the shop with a rucksack on and my shopping bags inside, and then I'd have to, you know, find an alternative way to get back. I wouldn't be able to run back, obviously, with all that shopping. That's uh, just not going to happen. If I was going to return to the man, which I hope isn't the case, you know, there's the alternative of being able to run to the man in a non-pandemic time, but that's gone now. So while I think, say, if I was working in central London, I might be capable of being able to run from here to central London to the man. Hygiene stroke pandemic wise, I think that surely is dead now because, you know, you have a look at those workers, those runners, and it's a very common visual in London. They would run to the office, they'd change out of their gear, they'd shower and put on their unironed work clothes and, you know, basically come to their desk half an hour later while their non-running colleagues have been picking up the slack for them. And surely that's gone now. It's too risky. Are you going to want to get into the shower at work? Are you going to want to risk an extra bathroom visit at work? It's, uh, it's just a nightmare. Everything has changed. Daniel Ruiz Tyson is available. Episode 264, Ways to Support the Show, an iTunes review. 30 seconds of your time if you've never reviewed the show on iTunes. If you have a, an iTunes stroke Apple podcast account, do please, if you enjoy the show, give it a rating and review. Vital to the show, uh, building an audience. And I say this after eight years of this show going, but uh, I can't stress it enough every week and I'll have to continue stressing it. You can also support the show via the PayPal and uh, coffee.com links at danielruistizen.com. Any uh, donation via those two links will get uh, the Patreon podcast we transfer to you uh, that week, if you're not a Patreon uh, supporter, obviously there's no point plugging the Amazon thing at the moment because, uh, or ever again, because uh, they've terminated the agreement. I really have to work out how I'm going to tackle that because that is a, a massive blow. But uh, most importantly, the best way to support this show is via the Patreon page. It's just six pounds a month. You're getting nearly two hours of content at the moment every week. There's also a second tier that I introduced, uh, a tier for those of you unsure about committing to supporting the show, the Toe Dipper. That means you get one Patreon uh, show every other week. Everyone in the UK, EU and the US can now pledge in their local currency of euros, British pounds or US dollars. And uh, that uh, helps prevent you paying extra conversion fees from your bank or card when pledging in a currency that's not your own. Patreons say they're working on additional currencies. The uh, conversion rate charge, those fees they pass on to the creators, that's not a problem if I can grow the number of Patreons. So patreon.com forward slash DRT available. Sign up there to support a different kind of podcast. Join the 16 keeping this show alive every week. Neighbour News now, they returned again on Friday. Uh, a recap, I was told that they'd had a mini stroke last week, which is why they'd gone back into hospital a second time. It turns out they didn't have a mini stroke now, so they don't know, or they didn't know what had happened to her, what had led to her having fallen again, which is a concern that they don't know. Uh, she was in hospital for what, six days again, came back on Friday, ambulance brought her back, Saturday morning, ambulance here again, and I saw her being carried into the ambulance, they kept her out there for about 20, 25 minutes, again, always a concern when an ambulance doesn't make its way to hospital straight away, and I have no further updates, I let the uh, neighbours know downstairs in case they weren't aware that she's gone back into hospital. So it's a concern. I just uh, appreciate that at the moment with hospitals, they don't want to be putting anyone into care given the COVID uh, situation. But right now we've got a situation where this uh, elderly woman is, has now been returned to her flat twice and within 24 hours, well, within 12 hours, she's back in hospital and you just wonder how much damage all that yo-yoing is uh, doing to her. The flat is too small for her to have a living carer. And right now, I think it's uh, basically the the morning carer who's turning up at 9.30 hours and is finding her on the floor that is really saving other days. So at least there's a, a care plan in place that if not quite resolving the situation, 
is at least saving her, really, because I think there's no way that she would get through another three or four days without anyone accessing the flat, as was the case four or five weeks back. I did say on that last Thursday's Patreon show that I needed to email the neighbours really to make sure that the water situation wasn't confined to my flat because I'd seen a, a water van outside the building, not a Thames water van, but it had uh, some water company livery on the side, livery, livery, urine, urinal, urine, urinal, urine, urine. And I just wanted to cross that off. And my aunt had been saying, you've got to ask, got to ask before you hang around waiting for Mickey Blue. Just didn't know how I would frame that email because the water query was, it probably needed a backstory to it. So I, th I was thinking that's going to be about two paragraphs. And then, you know, I've got a, an inquiry about the neighbor. That's going to be one or two lines. Should I start with the inquiry about the neighbor? How do I segue into the water thing? Or, you know, do I start with the water and then go into the neighbor? Maybe I'll start with the neighbor. And I was concerned that they'd read that email and think, well, he's not really asking about the neighbor. His concern is about the water. And then I'm thinking, yeah, but let's not forget that for, Two years, I was buying a right-wing paper uh, twice a week and then having to buy a celebrity mag every week and the Radio Times. Radio Times, fine, but the other three rags, come on, you know. If I want to send out an email with just two lines about her and two solid paragraphs about, uh, about a water query, I think I'm entitled to do it. So uh, basically, it does seem from the email that I got back that uh, the water issue is... Uh, just uh, particular uh, to me. Sunday, well, I'll keep you posted anyway about the neighbour. Sunday, I spent an hour, an hour yesterday, early evening, trying to flesh out the new podcast. The artwork had arrived and signed off on Friday, which I'm really pleased with. And they say you can find anything out on the internet. Well, I almost disproved that yesterday. Spent an hour researching one of the items that I've got planned for one of the early episodes of this new podcast, and there's very little information on it. I have a few leads in terms of who I need to speak to, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not hopeful that I'm going to be able to find much more information online, and I'm slightly daunted by that. But at the end of the day, I thought, well, this is why it's a challenge. This is why this show could work because. This information just isn't out there that could help this new show. But it's definitely going to be a challenge. It's going to take up a lot of time. And uh, now that I've got the artwork, now that I've paid for the artwork, I know that I need to do that to justify that uh, financial outlay on the artwork. On the books front, I'm still on the pastiche homes. I finished The Venerable Tiger by Sam Siciliano, which I covered on episode 263 on Thursday. I think it was one of his weakest books, but still a fun page turner. Now I'm reading the first collection of Holmes short stories from James Lovegrove, who's written eight complete pastiche Holmes novels. I think this is his first stab at a collection of short stories. One or two, I think, have been collated from other uh, short story compendiums by other uh, non-Conan Doyle Holmes writers. I heard the other day when I was talking about uh, Conan Doyle's uh, Holmes novels, I think there were four rather than two. I'm not sure if The Hand of the Baskervilles counts as a novel. Some people do count it as a, as a novel rather than a short story. I'm reading James Lovegrove, The Manifestations of Sherlock Holmes, a uh, collection of uh, 12 short stories. I'm not a big short story guy, but with Conan Doyle, because... The short stories, the home short stories were stronger than the actual novels. Uh, with Holmes, I don't mind short stories. You know, I'm used to them, but uh, I normally do tend to shy away from uh, short stories. And let me um, go to this review of uh, The Manifestations of Sherlock Holmes. Where is it here? I've got to click into my screen, so apologies if you're hearing any clicking. This is from a sci-fi book books uh, review site. So again, it gives you an idea of how authors are experimenting with uh, Sherlock Holmes titles in recent years. And I'm not a big sci-fi guy, but uh, you know, I, I don't mind these. Uh, let me come down to the review. The collection contains 12 delightful stories that are split almost evenly between traditional feeling home stories and tales that have a mischievous and fantastical edge 
Both types work in their own way. Lovegrove has proven in recent years that he can take the stylings of Conan Doyle and give them a slight modern polish to make them a little more palatable for today's audience. He need not do that uh, too much as the idea of Holmes's deductive reasoning still works brilliantly. The contained nature of the mysteries in the book allows Holmes to shine. There is a quick setup and then a solution is forthcoming within 20 pages or so. No need for padding, just pure 100% Sherlock. The traditional tale feels thus they would comfortably uh, set aside the originals as well as highlighting Holmes's prowess. They also give the reader a chance to solve the crime for themselves. And then they go on to say that um, it was the more fantastical tales that they enjoyed writing. As the estate of Conan Doyle is now copyright free, authors can play with the boundaries. Lovegrove has done this previously with his Kalulu crossover books. Now I have to check that word. I had to find a YouTube link that actually gives you the correct pronunciation because there are two pronunciations, two different pronunciations used by a lot of people, both apparently of which are wrong. And it's supposed to be Kalulu, according to this YouTube link, Kalulu. And uh, just to give you the background to that, and this is taken from a couple of sites that I suspect have borrowed it from uh, Wikipedia. Kalulu is a fictional entity created by fantasy horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. I'm a big fan of Lovecraft, actually. And it was introduced in his story, The Call of Kalulu, which was first published in the magazine Weird Tales in 1928. The creature is described as a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body prodigious claws on hind and forefeet and long narrow wings behind it is said to be so terrible to behold that it destroys the sanity of those who see it now you know fantasy and sci-fi it's not really my thing but you throw Sherlock Holmes into anything and I'm there you could stick him in an episode of EastEnders and I'd watch it the only Holmes thing I wouldn't engage with was uh, Sherlock simply because it was sh Now to this week's uh, Nectar Points update. Little Stockwell last week's trip, that was Thursday, and uh, that trip was covered in episode 263, I think, in some detail as I rejig my day for the uh, no-show Mickey Blue. Still no Newgate Beans in uh, any little. And I think there's Newgate Ravioli or Spaghetti. There are loads of uh, tins of those. Now, if I was Newgate, I'd see that and I'd think, well, why are we making that stuff? Look how well our beans are selling. Let's keep turning out the beans. We'll make a killing. Why waste time with all this other stuff? There was a woman in uh, Sainsbury's, and uh, this was uh, the Nine Elms Monster. There was a woman there who was carrying, I don't know whether it was a 12-pack. This was also on Thursday. I think it was a 12-pack or whatever it was, or an 8-pack. I think it was 12 of Lou Roll. And uh, personally, I've never had the need to go beyond a 4-pack. Obviously, she's anticipating the second wave. So she was carrying this 12-pack in one hand, pushing a buggy with the other hand, the free hand. She had uh, two kids with her, one in the buggy. So she was pushing the buggy one-handed. The one in the buggy had a four-pack. They couldn't have been more than three years old, I would say. The two kids walking, one must have been nine or ten. They were carrying whatever is up from the four-pack. The middle sibling, maybe a couple of years younger than the older brother, was carrying another four-pack. And it was just blatant hoarding. I was watching that and I was thinking, this is outrageous. You know, she's not so much got the second wave covered here. I think she's got the third and fourth waves seen to as well. I never understood the Lou Roll hoarding when it happened earlier this year. When the shelves start emptying of food again and the people who have about 100 Lou Rolls in their homes go shopping for food and come upon empty food shelves, they might start to wonder whether they actually will need all the Lou Roll that they've uh, hoarded. The logic behind this, um, I don't know, but it does make life difficult for those of us who don't want to go down the hoarding route, who feel uh, a sense of responsibility not to contribute to such behaviour. I'm not sure about the waves myself. I think this virus, I think it's just out there circulating. There'll be frequent local spikes. We're going to have to deal with it. I just hope that we don't see a return to that panic of the spring because that was stressful. It took up a lot of time 
And rather than people being able to adjust and focus on this pandemic and how to be sensible in a pandemic, which was new to all of us, we were having to descend on one shop after another just to try and do a normal shop, which probably facilitated the spread of the virus. There was that day, that Friday, I think it was back in April, where I wasn't able to do anything that Friday except go to so many shops in three or four different locations. Still wasn't able to do a complete shop that day. That was in the early days of uh, the lockdown. So I had to make a very early Saturday morning trip. I got to Sainsbury's, I think at 0800 hours on the Saturday morning and there was already a queue out there. I don't wanna go back to that, but I think we'll go back to that if people start hoarding again. Sloth Saturday, meanwhile, that was very slothful. There was a, a calzone conversion that was delayed after I struggled to pull one of the budget thin and crispy chicken pizzas out of the freezer. Ended up breaking a drawer. I really need to defrost that freezer. It is so difficult just to open any of the drawers. I told myself maybe it's all these workouts I'm doing. Maybe I'm stronger now. I don't know my own strength. And it was my left hand as well, just to impress me further. But I'm thinking it's not really an increase in strength. I think it's simply down to the fact the freezer needs to be uh, defrosted. So the drawer had snapped. Had to get the yoo that my aunt had given me late last year when a couple of my Star Wars vintage action figures were starting to fall apart. And I had to glue the drawer back together. Ended up with glue fingers, which wasn't ideal for sprinkling toppings on the calzone conversion. So there was some very, very thorough hand washing trying to get that... Uh, glue off but uh, the pizza finally went in and I'm pleased to report it was a very enjoyable calzone. There was also the fact that uh, it made Saturday a bit more full on Saturday evening because I had I think about three pints of semi skim milk that needed to be finished on the 29th so I had to guzzle it. I hadn't had porridge on a Saturday you know I never had porridge on a sloth Saturday because that would probably basically be the final sloth Saturday of my life if I had porridge in addition to everything else you know so I just have the lunchtime cereal with fruit and yogurt and you know that's slothful enough considering the beast of a meal that I'm having in the evening. So I had to finish all that milk on the Saturday evening uh, which left me a little bloated because uh you know, I don't want uh, to be wasting uh, milk. Anyway, let's get to the points now, just before I wrap up. So last week I was on 128 points. So I went into Sainsbury's on that. Can't remember what that was worth. So I bought another thin and crispy chicken pizza, uh, four pints of semi-skim milk with a decent expiry date on it. Had to buy um, two litres of water. i would got one in Lidl as well. I think the little one was 25p, this one in Sainsbury's was 50p, bought my yogurt, £1.50, bought some Sainsbury's own crackers, bought some more decaf coffee, £3.50, just because I'm drinking so much coffee that I think uh, the decaf might uh, help prevent uh, that heart attack. Uh, it's a crazy amount of coffee that I'm uh, drinking. I had to buy uh, a pint of full fat milk and a pint of semi skim milk uh, for my aunt and uncle. Bought um, uh, some polos, had to buy some shower cream, a uh, single tin of Sainsbury's own beans, 30p, the same price as the Newgate beans that you can't get anywhere. Had to buy some ham from there. Normally, a uh, little have ham for 75p, but I had to get the, uh, the ham for a pound in um, Sainsbury's because little were out of their uh, budget ham and the ham is one of the uh, ingredients it's actually the first layer of topping that goes on the uh, calzone also bought myself a backup budget shower cream for 30p and three single oranges for 90p i think we're coming into orange season i might be wrong on that i'm not an expert but uh, the oranges have improved in uh, quality in recent weeks so that was a £16.75 uh, spend that got me 16 points making for a new points balance of one pound, uh, sorry, of 144 points uh, worth 72p. I mean, that just sounds so little, doesn't it? 72p, all these points I'm accruing and it's 72p, but uh, don't allow yourself to be defined by your nectar points or your store points. Doesn't matter, back in the day, whatever, 144 nectar points, that would have been worth 288 points, I think pre-2016, I think I'm right in saying that. What can you do? 144 
points is better than nothing. And that is it. That is the end of this week's regular show. Patreon listeners will get their weekly bonus edition, episode 265 this Thursday. That will include a Star Wars football update in what has been a dramatic week in the game as the end of Silver Age Season 4 fast approaches. Maybe by then I'll have heard uh, from Mickey Blue. If you do want to join the those patrons sign up at patreon.com forward slash DRT available. It is the easiest way to support a creator. Thank you guys all for listening. If you're not joining us on Thursday, I'm back next Monday with episode 266. Get those shoulders back. Keep on walking towards the sun. Keep washing those hands. I'm Daniel Ruiz Tyson and this start of the week I have been available. Mm-hmm.